the goal of this lecture is to arrive at a definition. So there's going to be no theorem, but one of the most important definitions uh, with regards to persistence modules. And so the payoff comes uh, in the next lecture. So let's uh, take a step back before diving into this world um, and, and see where we are. So we had finite type persistence modules, which looked like this. They were sequences of vector spaces and linear maps. And because I said finite type, all the vector spaces are forced to be finite dimensional. And after a high enough index, all the maps AI are isomorphisms. And then we had uh, this cool uh, decomposition theorem that produced from each of these their barcodes. So the barcode of this VA was a list of um, intervals of the type i, j, allowing j to equal infinity. And of course, each one of these uh, occurred with some multiplicity, which I'll write via a subscript. So, you know, the this, this interval i1, j1 occurred with some multiplicity mu i1, j1. And then of course, there's i2, j2 with some other multiplicity um, and so on. So this was uh, the, the barcode. and um, and so this arrow, in order to prove the existence and uniqueness of the barcode, it used the classification of finitely generated FT modules. And so um, into, into sort of the free and torsion parts. And the free part generated the infinite bars, the ones where the J term was allowed to be infinity, and the torsion part created these bars where things were born and died at some finite um, died at some finite index. Now, um, in this lecture, we're going to sort of focus on the left side. So we're going to ignore uh, the barcode story completely. But what we want to get is a notion of distance between two persistence modules. And really, the big trouble with this. Um, we're trying to do this uh, with the persistence modules we know and hopefully love is that they're very discrete, chunky objects, right? V0, V1, V2. This is a very discrete uh, thing. I mean, in fact, I think when we define them, we call them discrete persistence modules. So in order for two of these things to be epsilon close for really tiny epsilon, uh, it's, you know, it's not really doable on this level of chunky uh, discretization. So we're going to first smooth out persistence modules so that they look like objects that, are, that live on the continuum rather than uh, on a grid. And then once you think about them geometrically, you're able to think of what a reasonable notion of distance between these would be. So our first order of business is to uh, undiscretize persistence modules. So um, let's start with that basic premise. Here's the definition, a continuous persistence module, uh, and I'm going to call it the same thing, uh, VA, as before, and we will say continuous or discrete, but most uh, modules that show up in this lecture are going to be continuous. That's sort of the whole point. Uh, is a family of vector spaces, so far looking extremely familiar, uh, VT, and now they go, they, there's one for every positive real number t. So it's not v0, v1, v2, but v0.013, v pi, v so on. So they're living over a much larger index set. Uh, and linear maps that go from left to right as before. But now we don't have finitely many linear maps. We have one every time uh, there is s less than t. So I'll write that map as a sub s less than t, and this guy goes from vs to vt. Uh, satisfying, so such that um, the, the sort of silly map uh, that goes from vt to itself is the identity. So it just sends the vector space vt to itself in the obvious silly fashion. And um, the other one is a composition law. So if you go uh, for all r less than s less than t, positive numbers, if you go directly from R to T, that's the same as first going from R to S and then going from S to T. So this, uh, these two conditions, 
the first one is for all t and the second one is for all triple, um, you should recognize them as being um, uh, functoriality. So this is this is a functor of some sort. Um, and, and all this is saying is that we have a functor from the poset of real numbers to the category of vector spaces. So if uh, the categorical language makes sense to you, then you can replace this entire definition by a uh, functor from the poset of real numbers ordered by the less than relation to the category of vector spaces over the field F. Your choice. Um, they're completely equivalent. Okay. Um, and so this is this is the full definition. There isn't any more to it. But but um, as someone who's been working with these for a while, I have a piece of advice, which is you think about these objects um, very, very geometrically, even though it looks like a continuum of vector spaces. So um, here's what I mean. I, I, I suggest you think about these as, um, as vector spaces living on a semi-infinite line. So this is uh, zero, and this is some s, this is some t, and you just think about having v0, the vector space here, v s, v t, and then there are maps from left to right. And then the composition law is saying, this the second uh, condition is saying, if you go from r to s and s to t, that straight arrow is the same as going directly from r to t. So, um, so it's going to be extremely helpful in everything we say to think about um, a line which has miraculously acquired superpowers where there are vector spaces and linear maps uh, on, on every point. Okay, so a few um, related things to note is every discrete persistence module, which I'll call V prime, A prime, can be realized as a continuous one. And let's call the continuous one, uh, one of the ways you can build a continuous one out of it, let's call it just VA. So as follows. So what you need in order to define a persistence module is a VT, a vector space VT for every real number T. And what you have available to you is a vector space for every integer, but that's fine. Every real number lives between a pair of integers. So VT is going to be um, V prime off the floor of T, which is the largest integer smaller than T, smaller than or equal to T. So this is all T bigger than zero. And the next thing we need is a map from A, um, uh, from V S to V T. So for all s less than t, and this is going to be uh, the obvious thing. So you send um, the uh, you look at the composite of the integer maps going from the floor of s to the floor of t, and this turns out to satisfy all of the the laws, the the two functorial laws that that we made upstairs. So so far we've vastly expanded the scope of our um, of what we considered persistence modules. So the discrete ones sit as this tiny uh, subset, but we have tons more now because things can change at S and T, which are not integers. Okay, um, what else? Uh, so maybe, maybe things have become uh, really general. So for instance, we cannot use uh, this finite generated uh, theorem in order to get barcodes because now we no longer have any condition on finiteness. So now that we've expanded to the continuous realm, we're going to sort of shrink back to something discrete looking and manageable while still remaining in the, in the realm of things being allowed to change at every t. All you do is say, instead of changing at every integer, you're allowed to change um, the data, the vector space data at, uh, at finitely many real numbers. So let's make that uh, sort of precise. Um, a continuous persistence module VA is called TAME. So TAME is going to play the role of finite type um, in this continuous world, if two conditions hold. So the first one is going to be no surprise whatsoever. It is that the dimensions of all the vector spaces uh, are less than infinity. 
So this is ex this is exactly analogous to what we had in the discrete uh, persistence module being a finite type. And this is where we're sort of going, trying to bring discreteness back. Uh, there exists a finite set uh, of uh, real numbers. So let's say zero less than t0, t1, t2, uh, tn. And I guess those shouldn't be less than equal to, otherwise we're just repeating the same number over and over, strictly less than, um, so that the linear map A um, Ti minus epsilon less than Ti plus epsilon uh, is not an isomorphism. So, um, Okay, so this might take a little bit of digestion. The The first part is, is fine. Um, the second part, which I will write to in red, is it might be new. So in order to figure out what's going on with this, you again, draw V, and now write there's T0, T1, T2. That looks entirely too regular, so I'm going to move T2 to being very close to T1. You know, a very large distance away, T3. So what's happening here is if you have any map AST going there, this need not be an isomorphism. In fact, it won't be. Uh, whereas if you lie in the same interval, these are isos. So what this is doing is, of course, it's making these continuous ones look very much like the discrete ones. Uh, so if you had 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, then you could just take T0, um, T1, T2, T3, and, and discretize these there. So for these tame modules, there's really no difference. Uh, it's just sort of a reparameterization of the discrete ones. So you can always produce a discrete persistence module from a tame continuous persistence module. Um, but in general, an arbitrary continuous uh, module, this that we won't have finitely many TIs, so things will be bad. And, and of course, over here, um, uh, within this int interval, or this interval, or even that interval, every, um, every horizontal map, uh, the A's there will be isomorphism. So you don't really lose anything by forgetting those little pieces. Up to isomorphism, everything is the same. Okay, um, and I guess the, the third observation to make is that uh, one of our familiar persistence modules, the indecomposable guys, um, still makes sense. So indecomposable uh, modules are precisely the ones that uh, live on intervals. So I, let's say ST, C, ST, still makes sense. So you can define these in the obvious way. So you have uh, the real line, there's S, there's T. Now remember, T could be infinity all the way out, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and these, uh, these are going to be um, zero outside this interval. So zero here, zero here. And they're going to sort of spike up. Uh, and here there's uh, copies of F. And every map with st in that uh, interval is an isomorphism um, so so that's that still makes sense there's no reason to anchor s and t to be um, at integers now is the, is the only difference and i guess um, you can easily check that in decomposables are always tame I mean, there's only two points s and t where the isomorphism type can change everywhere else the maps a are uh, a st is going to be an uh, isomorphism Okay, so with all of this in place, a corollary of our um, of our barcode decomposition theorem is that uh, tame, so hence continuous persistence modules also decompose into direct sums of interval modules. 
again, it's because of the of the dictionary we built between the tame uh, ones and the discrete ones here. So it's going to be exactly the same thing, but the, the, all you have to do is if you had a bar of type, uh, an interval of type 1, 3, then you'd want to send it to T0, T2, right? Just keep track of what the endpoints are. They need not be integers. Um, and so this looks like we've just uh, made things a little bit harder on ourselves by by passing to the continuous realm and then make the, made them easy again by looking at these tame guys. But the reason we are doing this is because now uh, we're allowed to find distances between persistence modules that are not going to be integers. And that's going to play a huge role in the subsequent uh, lecture. In fact, the whole theory of persistent homology rests on um, on being able to do this um, for uh, find barcodes for tame persistence modules. So, okay. Um, so now we're, we're almost ready to define distances between two persistence modules of this uh, continuous type. Uh, here is the key definition of this. So definition, uh, two continuous persistence modules are epsilon interleaved, and that's what we're defining. So we'll change the color there. Uh, for some positive epsilon bigger than zero, if there exist linear maps uh, so let's call these persistence modules something. Um, I think we'll we'll stick with V and W. So V, A, and W, B. Now let's get back to our regularly planned. Okay, so these two are going to be epsilon interleaved for epsilon bigger than zero if there exists linear maps uh, phi t from the tth vector space of the first one to the t plus epsilon vector space of the second one for all t bigger than zero and psi t going in the opposite direction. So you start with wt and go to vt plus epsilon t bigger than zero, uh, so that four diagrams commute. And I will draw two of them, and you are supposed to figure out the other two. Commute. So, um, so here are two of them. And the other two will remain mysterious for now. Okay, so um, the first one is for all s less than t. Uh, what maps are available to you? So you have um, you have v t. This goes to w t plus epsilon. Uh, on the this is via v t, and um, so I see I have messed up S and T, so let's say S is bigger than T. So then you have a map to Vs, and here you have Ws plus epsilon. So this is going to be Vs. And down here and up here, you have the usual maps that uh, define the module. So T less than S, B, T plus epsilon less than S plus epsilon. So these commute for every S bigger than T. So this is a parallelogram. relation. Okay, now there's a similar one which involves psi um, t and psi s. So you have to figure it out. It's going to go up and to the right. It's um, it's not so bad. You just, uh, you know, follow your nose and you get it. The other kind is uh, sort of stranger. So if you have vt and you do phi t, so this is for every t, not not a pair of things, just a single t. Uh, so you, you end up at wt plus epsilon, and then of course you're allowed to do psi t plus epsilon, and you end up at v t plus two epsilon. And then there's a standard map A that sends you from t to t plus two epsilon. And this also commutes. So this is a triangle relation. Where you first do um, uh, first do uh, phi and then do psi. And there's going to be a, a similar triangle relation here involving psi t and phi 
t plus epsilon, which you are supposed to get on your own. So these are, um, this is a definition of what it means for an epsilon interleaving to exist. So it's two families of linear maps, uh, this, uh, this phi and this psi, so that um, various uh, things commute. Now, this is, seems like an extremely strong relation for these linear maps to satisfy. Uh, and so we're going to think about um, when you would expect such an interleaving to even exist between two uh, continuous persistence modules. But the point is to think about them very, very geometrically. So the reason this is called an interleaving is you, you imagine, again, B as living here and W as living here. And what is happening is all the phi maps, so for instance, here's T, and here's T plus epsilon, all the phi's are pointing down and to the right. So there's phi T to give you an example. All the, um, all the size, so let's say there's S and S plus epsilon are pointing up and to the right. And basically, um, I've only drawn two arrows, but there's a continuum of red arrows going down and to the right, and a continuum of blue arrows up and to the right. And every possible um, parallelogram of red or blue, and every possible triangle involving one red edge and one blue edge going either way, uh, all those commute. So this is called an interleaving for that reason. I mean, there's a, it really, when you fill it out, it looks like a shoelace. Uh, so it's they're just braided together in this sort of terrifying uh, algebraic dance of commuting diagrams, the continuum, many of them. Okay, so that's an interleaving, and this is why uh, this is what induces uh, the distance. So uh, the interleaving distance. Um, let's let's say let's say it this way: um, the interleaving distance. Uh, d int between two persistence modules VA and WB is the smallest epsilon so that there exists an epsilon interleaving between VA and WB. So that's um, uh, that's the notion of distance that's going to play an enormous role in the next lecture, and this is what I wanted to get to. Um, there, uh, you're you're entitled if you if you know the definition of a metric space, which I hope many of you do. Uh, we saw it uh, in the first week of our lectures. Um, you are entitled to ask in what sense this is an actual distance. So. Um, I can say two things about that. The first one is that a zero interleaving is always an isomorphism. So a zero interleaving, if you imagine this braid diagram in the middle of the screen, um, is going to be a zero, uh, you know, the epsilon is zero. So the red arrows come straight down, no left, right, and the blue arrows go straight up. And the triangle law forces going down and coming up to give you the identity. Similarly, um, the other triangle law is going to say if you go up and come down, that's the identity on the vector space at the bottom. So um, that's that's an isomorphism between V and W. I mean, they, every vector space uh, V T is going to have the same dimension as W T, and these maps up and down are going to sort of certify that by giving you um, invertible linear maps. And of course, these invertible linear maps, because of the parallelogram law, which now becomes a sort of rectangle law because everything is straight. Um, is telling you that these uh, commute with the left to right maps of V and W, which are called A and B, I guess here. So um, it's not a metric in the sense that two things can have distance zero while not being the same object. On the other hand, uh, they're going to be isomorphic. So um, I guess it's a metric on isomorphism classes of continuous persistence modules. The second thing I want to say is, um, that the symmetry is obvious. So if phi and psi are giving you an interleaving from V to W, then you can flip the order of phi and psi to get an interleaving from W to V. So the definition is sort of nakedly symmetric. 
the hard part in showing that this is a metric is a triangle inequality. Uh, and so uh, before I end the lecture, I want to say a little bit about uh, the triangle inequality. Now this triangle inequality has not so much to do with these triangle relations that were used to define interleaving. We actually want to show that if uh, u, v are epsilon interleaved, that v, w are delta interleaved, then um, then u, w are also um, um, are at most epsilon plus delta interleaved. So, so the triangle inequality for the interleaving distance, which I think is one of the exercises in the notes. So this is going to be more of a hint than a complete uh, complete description of how to solve this. But so if um, let's say u v, and I'm not going to write the maps anymore. These are just two persistence modules. Um, uh, two continuous persistence modules are epsilon interleaved and VW uh, are delta interleaved. Then UW are epsilon plus delta interleaved. So if I can show that there is even one epsilon plus delta interleaving between u and w, you are guaranteed by the definition of interleaving distance that their interleaving distance will be less than or equal to epsilon plus delta because it's the infimum overall epsilon for which an interleaving exists. So if you can uh, find an epsilon plus delta interleaving, then you have a certificate that everything worked out um, and the distance is no more than epsilon plus delta. So if you want to build uh, the, this this type of interleaving, it really, really helps to think of these persistence modules as living on the line. So there's u, there's v, there's w. And let's say you had an epsilon interleaving, and let's go back and see. So we had red arrows coming down, going forward by epsilon. Uh, so this was um, s, this would be s plus epsilon, and this would be phi uh, s. And now you have um, blue arrows going up again by epsilon. So this would be psi s plus epsilon going to what spot is that? S plus two epsilon, I guess. And of course, this triangle would commute by one of the triangle relations. Now, going from V to W, I guess there could be a different. So let's say they're delta interleaved and delta is bigger than epsilon. So the slope is allowed to change. So this is. Um, s plus epsilon plus delta and this is some interleaving half of an interleaving p prime and now there's going to be another um, interleaving psi prime of s plus epsilon plus delta um, and you see what's happening here i mean um, we're we're slowly building the triangle law for the composition so the point is if you take uh, Sorry, this one should be labeled S plus epsilon, of course. But anyhow, uh, so if you take uh, this entire composite um, going from S uh, to S plus epsilon to uh, S plus epsilon plus delta, so this, this chase the two red arrows is what I'm saying, all the way down, you get a map going from the s position of u to the s plus epsilon plus delta position of w and then there's going to be a path up uh, and that's going to give you because everything in the middle commutes by the various relations it's going to satisfy the triangle relation so you can literally compose interleavings to get uh, larger interleavings and so that's the proof of uh, or that's a hint for how you can do the proof of the triangle inequality for the interleaving distance now, in the next lecture, we're going to show that barcodes are stable with respect to a certain distance uh, on the space of all barcodes. So if you change the persistence module a little bit with respect to interleaving distance, the bars can only change by that much. And um, this will have uh, some fun implications for doing uh, analysis of data with uh, persistent homology. So I'll see you there.